Yo, this is crazy to me. Check this out. So not too long ago, I was playing City Skylines, which is a pretty fun city simulator on Steam. But my entire city was powered by wind turbines. A week or so later after that, I was driving near Joshua Tree, California, when all of a sudden, all these wind turbines popped up out of nowhere. And that's when a smart idea clicked into my brain. If we were to use 100% renewable energies, then we can cut back on our CO2 emissions and stop climate change. Why aren't we using 100% renewable energy? <laughs> oh boy. Well, I'm sorry to be the one to break this to you, but you were playing a video game. Real life isn't as easy as video games can make things seem. Here, I'll prove it. Hi guys. Today's episode is about energy, and energy is another need more than 10 minutes to explain type of topic. You've got kilowatts and megawatts and gigawatts, which is all different from kilowatt hours, megawatt hours, gigawatt hours, but it's all equal to joules, and then you have volts and milliamps and direct current and alternating current, and it, it's just very deep. So please bear with me as I try and make this episode as layman's as possible. Back to the episode. In City Skylines, when you place a wind turbine, you get a capacity credit or the percentage of max megawatts that you can bet on for an average power output of 100%. Meaning, if you place an in-game wind turbine with a max of 10 megawatts, you can get all 10 megawatts of power 100% of the time. Because the in-game wind power doesn't change. But you and I both know that's not how wind works in the real world. Some days you can have strong consistent wind, and other days weak to no wind at all. Not to mention, studies show that real wind turbines have an average capacity credit of about 24%. Not meaning 24% of constant trustworthy power output like in game, but a 24% yearly average. So a top of the line Vesta's V164 wind turbine is maxing out at 8.3 megawatts. That's actually a yearly expectation of about plus or minus 2 megawatts per wind turbine. But again, this is tricky info because wind turbine technology is growing fast and depending on what wind farm that you ask, the 24% capacity credit is an outdated number. So again, a quick answer to why we aren't using all renewables is because life isn't a video game. There are lots of moving parts that make it just a little bit deeper than that. Damn. So I didn't have a smart idea after all. Oh well. But after hearing all that mess, I can't help but to think. Will our CO2 emissions always be high? Whoa, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. Please don't get the wrong idea from me. First of all, just because wind power isn't all too reliable doesn't mean that wind power is of no use. Sure, wind power makes up for about 5% of the energy needs in the United States. Well, over in Denmark, as of 2015, wind power makes up for 42% of their energy needs. Okay, alright. Denmark is about the size of the state of New York, sure. But the point is that wind power can be of great use. Also, just because wind power might not be the best idea to trust for 100% of your energy needs, it doesn't mean that wind power is the only renewable energy. Costa Rica, for example, runs on 90% hydroelectric dam power and geothermal power. Real quick, in case you didn't know, hydroelectric dam power is when water passes through dams to make electricity, and geothermal power is making electricity from the natural heat below the surface. But a little more on this later. See you then. And that last 10%? Other renewable energies. Yeah, you've heard right. Costa Rica has the infrastructure to run 100% renewable energy. Although for them to run at 100%, it kind of depends on their weather and seasonal situation. But still, that means almost no emissions and adding almost nothing to climate change. Which, those are for sure benefits to using renewable energy. Ah, well, excuse me then. <laughs> so if renewable energy is the way to cut emissions, it seems, then why isn't the US and other countries without building more hydroelectric dams and geothermal power plants? Well, in order to answer this question, we have to look at the process of making power from these plants. But first, sound the lame as alarm. 
To put it very simply, when water passes through hydroelectric dams, the flow of water powers a turbine, or a rotating device used to turn fluids, gases, air, and more into energy. But the most important thing here is the flow of water. The more the water, the more the possible power, which gives an upper hand to some places like Costa Rica, where heavy storm seasons would give a nice upper hand, providing lots of water and higher water levels. Not to mention this really important fact, Costa Rica's energy needs, like Denmark, is nowhere near the size of other countries, which makes using more renewables a lot harder for bigger countries. As for geothermal energy, drilling rigs must be drilled into the earth to a point in which the earth is hot enough to change water in the earth's crust into steam, then letting gravity bring the steam up to the surface, using the steam to make electricity with the turbine as it rises. If you want to know how geothermal and hydroelectric power plants work, I've linked a couple of really good videos in the description, so they're there if you're interested. Now to your question about the United States adding more renewables. It sounds as easy as just drilling all over the place, right? Well, not all geography is equal, meaning geothermal power does not cost the same everywhere. For example, Iceland is one of the most active volcanic places in the world, so they don't have to drill too far for their geothermal plants to actually be worth it. In more unfit geographical places, however, you'd have to spend lots and lots of money on equipment and time drilling miles and miles just to get a similar result, as well as some other geographical things that make it hard. As for hydropower, thanks to a 2012 report done by the United States Department of Energy, we know that there are about 54,000 unpowered dams that can already make about 12 gigawatts of combined power. So seeing as about 1 megawatts of hydropower can power 400 homes. 1 gigawatt equals 1,000 megawatts, 12 gigawatts equals X megawatts, X equals 12,000 megawatts, 1 megawatt equals 400 homes, 12,000 megawatts equals X homes, X equals 4.8 homes. That's more homes than 43 US states currently hold. Wait a second, please don't tell me you're... Oh, boring screen math, you dastardly bastard. Don't smile at me, boring screen math. Get out of here. As I was saying, so naturally now you're wondering, well, if we have this dam power that can power a whole state or two, then why aren't we building more or at least changing unpowered dams into powered dams? Well, truthfully, I have no idea. My research only showed me why we should do it, but nothing about why we shouldn't do this. So that's why I asked my engineer friend and renewable energy enthusiast, Kyle Kitzmiller, who knows a lot more about this than I do. Kyle, any thoughts? I actually don't know about the dams that exist now and why they wouldn't be powered. My guess, I'd, I'd have to think about it. I actually, I don't really know. Cool. Um, it's a good, it's a good question. I, I honestly don't know. Well, all right then. I still have no idea why we haven't changed more unpowered dams. I've even reached out to InsightEnergy.com for some help on this, which is a great insightful YouTube channel and website about the latest and greatest on energy. If you've never checked them out, link is also in the description. But even they don't have a clear-cut answer. Truthfully, I found that there's very little on the topic of unpowered dams, and I would really need more funding to be able to get to the bottom of this. But until then, this mystery is going to kill me. If you happen to have the answer to this and you want to help me feed my curiosity, please email it to me so I can add it to my 2016 corrections video. Last thing I want to add here though, let's say that your city imports power from the state over. How do you think that power gets to your house? A power plant connected to a web of power lines that travels all the way until it gets to your city? Well, Kyle has the answer for you. These high voltage power lines, they expect to go from a power source to a city. That's most of the way they're gener you know, that it's set up right now. So the, the going between the cities, we don't have very much of that. So there was a bunch of solar power plants and wind farms that were out east. They had to build this transmission line because out in the desert, there wasn't any power infrastructure, right? There wasn't any electricity infrastructure. They had to build a whole power link to bring it into San Diego. Now, this insight is actually really important. 
We all wish that our power lines could go city to city because it could save us a lot of money and other things. But currently, by the way that our energy infrastructure is set up, if you want power, you have to run a power line straight from the power plant all the way to the place that you want power. Which makes adding renewables hard to do with our arguably out of date energy infrastructure. In fact, the longest power line in the world is the Rio Madeira system in Brazil that carries power from plant to place over 1500 miles. Or or 2400 kilometers for all you internationals out there. Now that is a process that you have no choice but to appreciate. Very interesting, but it makes sense now. The reason why places like the US and other countries aren't adding more renewable energy is because the geography of places like Costa Rica, for example, give them the upper hand on certain energy sources. And not to mention, they don't compare anywhere near the size of US when it comes to energy needs as well as some other mysterious things for now. But okay, last question. So if those energy sources might not be the best way to make the US more renewable, what would a 100% renewable USA look like? Well, this is a question better suited for an expert. So Kyle, what will a 100% renewable United States look like? I think that wind will be number one, like, because we have a lot of wind capacity and wind capacity is very cheap. I think probably solar will be number two. We already have a fair amount of hydropower. You might have some offshore wind. We have a lot of offshore capacity. The problem with renewables is how they interact with the power grid, right? You might have a lot of wind energy, a lot of solar energy, but you only have a little bit of demand. And when you have a little bit of wind or solar, you have a high demand. So what's a way to counter that is to share energy across the nation. So if you had a lot of wind out in Ohio and nobody's you know, using it, they have extra capacity, it would be great if you could shuttle that to California, shuttle that to New York, you know what I mean? Shuttle that all the way across the country. I think an overhaul is needed. The challenge is almost always the upfront cost. Somebody has to foot the bill for overhauling an infrastructure system and then you have to somehow navigate the maze of regulations because power is highly regulated in the United States. So it's a maze of regulation it's a, and it's a maze of like a really high upfront costs. The power infrastructure is how we tap into the enormous amount of renewables that we have in the United States. You can't just keep putting more wind tur turbines in at some point. The biggest one that you'll see is everything that you own will just be more efficient our energy consumption is insane. We use so much. As these those start to transform, become smarter, all the components get more efficient, that'll allow us to use less electricity, which is really a key part of this. Will the renewable future that Kyle predicts happen? Maybe, but as Kyle has laid out, we still have lots of work to do, mostly with energy infrastructure. Being able to build the best renewable plants wherever that may be and being able to share its power no matter the amount will make renewable energy that much easier to evolve and obviously would make it a lot more possible for countries like the United States and more to use more renewable energy. And before we end this episode, I know I digress a lot, I know, I know, but there's just so much that's exciting about energy and that's why I want to quickly explore other energy sources. As we take steps into the future with every waking second, helium-3 is another energy source that we're looking into. It isn't necessarily a renewable source, but it is clean energy with zero emissions. Problem is that it's rare here on Earth, but there is lots of it on the moon. And the best news about this is that China is actually planning to revisit the moon with the goal of mining helium-3 and bringing it back to Earth possibly giving us not only the most useful energy source in human history, but the most clean energy source as well. And if you're more interested in other energy with higher chances, well, on the rise is algae biofuel. Seeing as we can grow algae farms and emission wise, algae biofuel is what they call carbon neutral, or the amount of CO2 that it makes when it burns is equal to the amount that it absorbs over its lifetime. So there's actually a lot to be hopeful for when it comes to other energy sources in the future. Very nice. So when it's all said and done, I was foolish to compare our reality to a video game, but I'm really glad that I did because I learned a lot today. Renewable energy is an exciting and noble path to lead our future into, but it may not be our only option. It's important to understand the point of renewable energy it's to cut our CO2 emissions and not destroy our planet. 
And the most exciting thing about the future is that it will always be unknown. Will Team Earth eventually go down the path of renewable energy sources? Or will Team Earth eventually go down the path of extraterrestrial energy sources? Or will Team Earth go down some completely unexpected path for our energy sources? Only time will tell, but either way, I hope that we do its best for Team Earth. Man, what great information on renewables, but that damn mystery, man, it's going to kill me until I find out. <laughs> but anyways, today I have one simple question for you. Do you think that climate change is real? Cast your vote by clicking that question on screen. It should be in the top right corner. And if you're on mobile, feel free to cast your vote in the chat section. Guys, if you enjoy this episode, please help me out by hitting that subscribe button and follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Seth Stuff. It helps me create a lot more cool stuff for you guys, more than you know. At any rate, I hope that you found something curious in today's episode. But whatever the case may be, remember to always feed your curiosity.